everybody, welcome to another episode of Tell Me About Your Damn Book. I'm your host, Stephen Lomer, and my guest this week is David Moore. David, welcome. Thank you, Stephen. Glad you. you were able to make I'm, it today. It's my pleasure, believe me. I'm glad to have you here. Now, uh, I have some uh, exhaustive research here on you. I bet. Um, and my goodness, you have, you've been around the block a couple of times, would you say? Uh, okay. Is that right. a fair statement? Are you asking for my age? Or are you <laughs> <laughs> no, no, unless, you, unless, that's a, unless that's a relevant point. My, I, I'm saying you've, you've done a lot. You have done a lot in your a lifetime. Few things, yes. a, a few things. All right. Yeah. All right. Let's, ladies and gentlemen, this is this is a few things right here. You just get comfortable for a second. Um, you are a two-time winner of the Epi Award for commentary on uh, mediaethics.org. iMediaethics. iMediaethics. iMediaethics.org. iMediaethics. Yes, org. It's, a, it's a very interesting website. It's a media critics website. Okay. And it's uh, designed to try to keep the media straight. So there. Uh -huh. So what I, my part of that is simply mostly to focus upon the polling stories uh -huh. and whether, how the polling stories are good or bad or, you know, what their utility is. And that comes from experience that I've had 30, 40 years in the polling field. Right, right. Yeah. So now what is an Epi Award and, and how do you win one? Well, it's editors and publishers. Okay. And so in the editors and publishers uh, make an award for one of the categories that I had was for um, news commentary, okay. but they dis they divided into two groups. Those sites that have less than a million uh, unique visitors per month, okay. and those sites that have more. I was in the one that had less. Okay, uh, all right. The Ethics is a good website, but it's it's not CBS News or <laughs> things like that. <laughs> right. So I got it for the uh, smaller website. Gotcha. Okay. Now, uh, b before we go on to, to any other topics, w what are your thoughts on uh, media ethics these days? Well, I think there's, uh, there's a lot to address because of the bifurcation, shall we say, mm -hmm. of the media. Uh, people tend not to have one media so I mean not to have a uh, one media source or at least Americans tend not to have one media source you know not the three major networks or not just two or three uh, newspapers that are all serviced by the Associated Press but we now more and more tend to find those media organizations that fit our own ideological leanings sure so as a consequence uh, we find quite different views of the world from different people depending upon what media source they have. From an ethical point of view, uh, there are questions uh, when the media, when some of the media uh, newspapers, for example, can't cite the sources or they come up with uh, uh, stories that uh, are not backed up by evidence. Mm -hmm. um, most recently, uh, Fox News, for example, had two uh, of its reporters, on-air reporters, joined with President Trump, something that would be considered really unethical by most media organizations. Sure. On the other hand, we know that the New York Times and Washington Post have also had reporters who have done, uh, who have sometimes fabricated stories. So there's probably no media organization that is not subject to some kind of violation by the reporters. And it's always important for those organizations to try to clear up the problem and try to reinforce the notion that they're trying to be as objective as possible hmm. and prevent, you know, provide real news, as they say, not fake news. <laughs> right, right. Yes, I hate that term. Yes, right. Um, what about, what are your feelings on uh, media organizations outside uh, the United States that are reporting on the United States? Do you think they have uh, a much less biased uh, viewpoint? Well, they often have a different viewpoint uh, because uh, most news organizations in this country tend to be supportive of patriotism, of uh, essentially the American point of view. So for example, uh, when we went to war uh, in Iraq, mm -hmm. you know, the news media, including the New York Times, Washington Post, very supportive of what the administration said. Later they came to regret that they had been uh, misled. But if you wanted to find a more objective reporting of what was going on, you might go to The Guardian, you know, in the UK, mm -hmm. or some outside news source. 
And of course, we Americans don't know very much about outside news sources outside the United States because no, we, we don't, don't speak the language. <laughs> We hardly even speak English much <laughs> instead of American. So well observed. Uh, yeah. So, so you know. Uh, so the notion that uh, Americans might be influenced by outside media sources is not too great, assuming they're not hacking us or anything like that. But you know, just normal reporting on their part. Right. Right. Very yeah. true. Yes. Yeah. In 2006 is when I wrote "I Had to Steal an Election." It was. It's a bad title because it's really about what happened on election night 2000. Ah. And, and the missed call at 2 o'clock in the morning by Fox News that was then immediately jumped on by all the other networks and that all had to be recanted about two hours later. They called it, you know, they called it for, um, uh, for Bush. Uh -huh. And then it had to be recanted because the election results were so close down in Florida. And ultimately, when a final, and of course, you know, the Supreme Court, Bush versus Gore, decided not to allow a complete recount. But when a complete recount was done a couple of years later by NORC in Chicago, National Opinion Research Center, mm -hmm. uh, they did a very objective thing. They looked at all the ballots. They found out that Gore had actually won by about 54 votes. <laughs> wow. I did not know that. Oh, I, yeah. I did not know that Gore won the election. Yeah. He, he, well. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning things today. <laughs> so, so the book was really about how the networks miscalled the election and then created such a terrible environment down there. We see it again right now. Sure. A terrible environment that really caused the Supreme Court and probably Justice Kennedy to say, well, we got to calm this down. So they went along and supported uh, Bush over Gore rather than allow a full recount of all the votes. So things could have been quite different uh, had that happened, but it didn't. And anyway, that was what the book was about. It was in 2006. I had been at Gallup for 13 years, so I went down and talked to Jim Clifton. Said, "I got this book coming out." And so that was my second book. Okay. So now, what would you, uh, upon reflection, what what do you think you would title it if you if you had the? Well, it was really. It was probably I. I was going to title it. Jebby says we got it. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I was going to title it that is that Jeb Bush was the one who was with his brother, you know. Right? Yeah, yeah, sure. And he, you know, and he's from Florida. Yeah. So he was on the line. This was very unethical. On the line with the people from Fox News. And he said, no, I'm sure that Florida is going to go. I know Florida. I'm the governor of Florida. I know it's going to go for my brother. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and as a consequence, what really happened is that the guy who was there was their cousin, and he was the one who was ahead of the decision desk at Fox. <laughs> and so he said, Jeffy says we got it. And so they immediately called it at two o'clock in the morning or so. And then immediately after that, um, uh, it was NBC followed. Yeah. And then I was with CBS at the time. Uh -huh. That's why I had the kind of the insight. And CBS and CNN, they had a joint decision desk. Immediately followed after that. And then ABC thought, no, we shouldn't do it. But they felt if they didn't do it, they would be the only ones left out. Right, right. So they <laughs> called it for Bush. <laughs> And then two hours later, when the numbers kept coming in and it showed that it was too close to call, they had to recant. Oh. So that's what that book is about. And so it, so I said, Jimmy said, we got it. That would be the title. Yeah. But uh, one of the suggestions was American Con, you know, as though there's a con by the media or media con or something. Right. Um, but eventually he decided how to steal an election. I thought, no, this wasn't really about how to steal an election. It was more about what is happening on election night. Right. But I was stuck with the title and had to adjust some of the parts of the book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's all true what I say in there, insofar as I understand it. You know, right. I'm not saying there's some judgment in there. Uh, but I wasn't really trying to make the argument that the missed call caused was the stealing of the election. I wasn't trying to make that argument, but ultimately... I did. <laughs> Ultimately, it was. Yeah, yeah. You could always add. Uh, Jebby says we got it as the subtitle to it if you do a if you I, do a new edition. No, it's, <laughs> it's uh, how uh, George Bush's brother and Fox Network mixed called the 
2000 election and change the course of history. Ah, there you go. That's an even better subtitle. I I'll like that well, one. I'll tell you. I'll tell you, it's a good book. <laughs> Uh, we need to step away for a moment. We will be right back with David Moore. Welcome back to Tell Me About Your Damn Book. I'm here with David Moore, and look what has materialized between us. It is a book, and when there is a book, there is only one thing that I am required to say. So, David Moore, tell me about your damn book. Okay, the title first, Small Town, Big Oil. The untold story of the women who took on the richest man of the world and won. That richest man of the world was Aristotle of Nassus, and ah. in 1973, Ari, as his friends called him, wanted to put on Durham Point, in the town of Durham, the biggest oil refinery in the world. Ah. It would have been a $600 million project, wow. which in today's money is around $3.2 billion. My That's goodness. how much. It would have uh, refined 400,000 barrels of oil every day. That is an incredible, and it would be in this small bucolic town of Durham, which is just about 10 miles in from the coast. And the uh, plan was to offload the oil at the Isles of Shoals, okay. which is, you know, off Massachusetts, well, off New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, but nine miles off the coast from Rye, New Hampshire. And through an underground, underwater pipe, they would have pumped all the oil to Rye. And then from Rye, overland through what was then Pease Air Force Base, mm -hmm. then under Great Bay, the Piscataqua River comes in, comes in from the ocean and forms Little Bay and then Great Bay. And they would have gone under that and into uh, Durham, Durham Point. Okay. Uh, so that was in 1973, and it was a time when food prices were going up, when there was an oil shortage, there were long gas lines. Sure. Um, people couldn't get gas every day. As a matter of fact, sometimes they couldn't get gas at all. Uh, but if they could get gas, it would be because their license plate was on odd numbers. They could get it on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. It was even numbers, or if it has a letter, they could get it on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And then on Sunday, they might not get anything at all, which, of course, discouraged these Sunday trips that people would take. Sure. So that was kind of the uh, environment, the, the economic environment at the time. Okay. And so when NASA came in, he was promising in the town of Durham that you would get, that we would get more heating oil and gasoline. We would get 15,000 new jobs, which of course was a big deal in the recession. Mm -hmm. It was the worst recession since the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And finally, Durham itself would get a humongous tax break because it's a property tax you know, in New Hampshire, property tax is the biggest tax we don't have, an income tax or sales tax. So property tax, presumably, would uh, lower in New Hampshire because the refinery would be paying most of it. So those were the promises that were brought in. Well, as anybody who's been to certain parts of New Jersey and certain parts of Louisiana, certain parts of Texas, know that once you start putting in the big oil refineries, and this would have been the biggest in the world, there are all sorts of satellite industries there as well. And so it would have really totally changed 
the character of the sea ghost. Not only that, chances are pretty good, according to the research that was done, that there would be some oil spills. Really? No. Yes. Oil spills? <laughs> they thought, hmm. <laughs> and as it turns out that if there's like four parts per million of oil into the water would have devastated the fisheries industry. Wow. And so this was oil that would, that would of course, travel. We're not talking about small oil spills. I mean, that is a small oil spill, four parts per million. But we're talking about, based on experience, the notion that there would be significant oil spills every year. They just simply are. Sure. And that would have gone down past New Hampshire and into Massachusetts. It would have affected it, and it would have affected the uh, Maine, you know, right around the Portland area as well. And so the three women that are highlighted in here are Nancy Sandberg, who organized the town, Phyllis Bennett, who was the publisher of Public Occurrences, and Dudley Dudley. A lot of people know the Dudley Dudleys, that the iconic representative of the town. And right here on the book, there's a picture of Aristotle Onassis and a picture of Dudley Dudley at the time. Dudley's responsibility was try to convince, she was the only Democrat from Durham. Mm -hmm. We had four reps. Okay. We had 400 <laughs> people in the house. <laughs> okay. New Hampshire has the third largest legislative body in the world. Right. Beside United States, Great Britain, and then there's New Hampshire. So, <laughs> 424 people. Crazy. So anyway, we had four people from Durham, but three were Republicans, and so she was the she was the only woman, the first Democratic woman elected from Durham ever, uh, and it was basically a Republican town, and so it was her job to try to persuade the legislature not to support this oil refinery, despite all the promises, um, and. That's what this book is about. Wow. We have a, a segment on the show called The Five. And it's uh, five standard questions that we ask all the authors who, who come on the show. So uh -oh. this will be fun because you didn't receive the questions beforehand. I so did not. I did not know. I, no one ever does. I, <laughs> I could just stand up and walk out. You right? could. Yes, you absolutely could. We haven't had that yet. So okay. uh, and, and feel free to say pass on any of them. OK. <laughs> uh, OK, so question number one. If they published an author's yearbook today and you were in it, what would you be voted most likely to do? An author's yearbook? Yes. Oh, I don't know. I don't know, make a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be voted most likely to make a mistake? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I'd probably argue with somebody. Argue yeah, with somebody. Yeah, that's, okay. That's yeah, fair. That's I fair. Tend to, I, I tend to be contentious. Okay. But I don't think so, but other people have suggested so. So they might vote you that um, yeah, in an author's might, yearbook. Yeah. Okay. They'd be wrong, though. <laughs> They'd be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's not contentious at all. They are wrong. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, question two. Which four faces would appear on your author's Mount Rushmore? Oh, I like Murakami and Ishiguro. Okay. I like those two. And uh, there are so many. I mean, I mention those mostly because I've really started reading them, and they're just really, you know, fantastic. And... and uh, Beyond that, you know, there's so many. I guess uh, Joyce Carol Oates, what a what a writer. Sure, uh, she's got so many uh, outstanding books, and she just continues to write. What a model! Uh, somebody who writes, writes and runs. Uh -huh. she, she writes and runs all the time. Yep. Um, and uh, I don't. I guess. I know he's a bit of a contentious writer, but maybe that was good. I liked Philip Roth. I liked him. 
But you know, that's just because you catch me at this this moment in time. Moment, yes, in a different moment, <laughs> I would probably think of somebody else. Sure, sure, yeah. Well, my my uh, my own Mount Rushmore changes all the time, so we'll capture this one moment in okay. amber. Okay, right. <laughs> and those are those are your four. Yeah, but don't take it to heart. <laughs> no, right, right, exactly. In, in a year's time, we'll we'll check in again. Oh, how about tomorrow? <laughs> how about tomorrow? Yeah, yes, right. tomorrow we'll check in again. Um, question three: What's something about you that almost nobody knows? Well, probably anything. <laughs> <laughs> anything? Yeah, probably anything. Uh, I don't know. You're a bit of a closed book. I was born in Hawaii. You were born yeah, in Hawaii? Yeah, there you go. Really? Yeah, most people don't look at me and say, you must be from Hawaii. <laughs> They don't say that. No, they don't. No, that's. I, uh, I wouldn't. No, that wouldn't be my first guess. Okay. There you go. <laughs> now would, you know. Now I know. There. Now so and then. Now everybody knows. Does. He was born in Hawaii, people. Yeah, uh, well, that's because my father was assigned there. Oh, okay. And it was right before World War Two. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So it was right before the uh, Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Okay. So I was born in 1940, and this happened December 7th, 1941. Right. Right. So okay. That's so I was. That's why I was in Hawaii. Um, so okay. There you go. There you go. All right. Uh, question four: What is your favorite curse word, and in what phrase would you be most likely to use it? Golly gee, will I curse? <laughs> Watch your language. And if you, if there you might really, be children watching. Good and lord! If you that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that's the answer you're going to go with. Uh, <laughs> that's fair if you want to. Uh, <laughs> well, I like really. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean. Oh, I, that. Oh, that's yeah, the, that, like, that's like, the because that's that really gets you know somebody says something really. <laughs> All right, that's a fair answer. I'll go with that. Okay, that's that's totally fine. And question five: uh, If the world ended right after this video, what final message would you want to convey to your fans? <laughs> I th the problem with that the premise of that question uh -huh. is that if the world were to end, right, I would not have an opportunity to give a message. True, but the world is ending after the video, so you would have a very brief window to, to provide a message. Okay. Uh, now we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> now we'll find out. I guess I would just say, you know, good luck. <laughs> good luck. Good that's that's per You know yeah, what? Yeah. No one has said that, but that's brilliant. Yeah. That's a perfect good answer. Luck. Good luck. If it works. You know, Good you luck, know, everyone. Yeah, everything you've been doing during your life, you know, does it work? It doesn't. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Golly gee willikers. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, David Moore, for joining me. The book is, I, I will read it this time, Small Town Big Oil, The Untold Story of the Women Who Took on the Richest Man in the World and Won. And it's available on Amazon.com? It is. Okay. Thanks. So if you're interested in this fascinating story, head over to Amazon, grab yourself a copy. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Cheers. Thank you.